Good afternoon, uh, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. Uh, welcome to uh, this meeting of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Michael Atkins, and I am the chair of this committee. Uh, those of you present in the council chamber, can you please note that uh, everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. Um, Please also note that the camera follows the microphone being switched on, so please wait a few seconds before speaking and allow the camera to catch up. Um, if you are participating in the meeting via live stream, um, please indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column um, and do not use the chat column for any other purpose. Uh, please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless invited to do so otherwise. Please also switch off or silence any other devices that you have so they do not interrupt proceedings. Uh, please use a headset when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. And finally, when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And when you have finished addressing the meeting, please turn your microphone off immediately. Speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anybody. Item one on the agenda is apologies for absence. Uh, Patrick, are there any apologies for absence today? Uh, yes, Chair, we've had apologies from Councillor Jeff Harvey, and no other apologies. Uh, thank you. I also received uh, apologies from Councillor John Williams, who often attends remotely but is unable to do so today. Um, item two, uh, declarations of interest. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? And if it subsequently becomes apparent, please raise it at that point. Uh, Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Chair. I have my usual declaration of interest as a non-remunerated director of South Cam's Limited Training, Trading as Women Street Homes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stamford. Councillor Stobart. And, sorry, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm a member of the Grace Cambridge Partnership Assembly and there's financial transactions recorded in, in relation to them in the uh, agenda pack. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Stobart. Thank you, Chair. I'd, I'd like the uh, committee to note that I'm a director of uh, South Cambridgeshire Investment Partnership and South Cambridgeshire Projects, two partnerships in which the, uh, uh, in which the council has a 50% stake. Thank you, Councillor Stobart. Um, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, I think a few uh, members uh, wish to raise one or two corrections. Um, uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's just in relation to the final page of the um, minutes, which is page 9, item 10, matters of topical interest. Um, it's not the Treasury Management Toolkit, it's the Audit um, Efficiency Toolkit, which I imagine, get it ready, Patrick, I'll be asking again for an update at matters of topical interest. Um, the other thing is in relation to the independent ch uh, chair. Um, chair, I'm sure you'll, you'll recall better than I what you said in the meeting, but I don't believe we were invited to offer potential candidates. I think that might cause a few um, issues if we were to do that. Mainly, you would question their independence. So I think that might just be a, a bit of a, um, an error there. But one thing that hasn't been recorded, which I raised at that point of the meeting, was that we had previously done work in looking at options for an independent chair, um, chair of the committee, but it could be an independent person on the committee. Don't want you to feel that your, your position is in jeopardy, Chair. Um, but uh, that, that might be a good starting block rather than just completely starting from scratch. It, it may not be you know, entirely relevant, but would be a good basis for us to start looking at those options again if we wish to explore it. Um, which hasn't quite been captured in the minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, my recollection of my remarks, and I admit I've not checked back the recording, but under um, the, uh, the issue of an independent member, I think I invited members of the committee to consider um, how they would envisage the process working and what kind of criteria they would uh, seek to uh, have for an independent member rather than... Uh, direct uh, sort of putting candidates forward um, so perhaps the minutes could be amended to reflect that thank you um, could we uh, 
also add uh, on, uh, so page seven, so on the first page of the uh, minutes, um, I believe Councillor John Williams was in attendance uh, remotely. Um, so if that could be added uh, to the minutes. Um, also, I think it's a little, uh, a little confusing to list uh, Mr. Tully under the section of auditors. Um, for whilst he is an auditor, he is a, an employee of the council um, and whether he would be better in the officers category. Um, it may be that that's where we always put him, but uh, it struck me that on reviewing it that um, it, he, it's perhaps best to reflect that he, that he is, although an auditor, he is, he, he's not in, you know, he is, uh, he is the internal auditor and therefore an officer of the council. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank, I, I appreciate, and I think you're right to ask for the distinction um, of internal auditor, but my understanding is that Mr. Tully works for one of the shared services and isn't actually a, a direct officer of this council. Um, it's very, it's very complex, isn't it? We've got the different services, for example. But I think if we had the word internal auditor, here is Mr. Tully. He's going to, he's going to define his role, hopefully. Then that may help. So he's actually employed by the city council, Cambridge City Council. Yes, uh, Mr. Tully, is that, is, does that uh, do, do you agree? Do you, do you agree that, that that you are represented correctly as it stands? Uh, thank you, Chair, for highlighting it. Um, I don't really have anything to add. It's correct. I'm an employee of Cambridge City Council, which is a shared service. Um, personally, I have no preference where I uh, appear on that report. It's a historical uh, convention at uh, South Cams. If the committee wanted to move it to other section, I would be happy with that. OK, well, happy then perhaps to leave it where it is. Let's just make sure that that's, um, that that's clear in the, in the minutes. Were there any other comments on the minutes uh, before I move on? No, thank you very much. So I, I, I move the approval of the minutes subject to the corrections that uh, we've just outlined. Thank you. Any objections? Fantastic. Uh, item four invites the committee to discuss the external audit uh, result report for 2019-20. Uh, could I ask uh, Ms. Dawson and Mr. Russell to please uh, present this report? Thanks very much, Chair. Um, so yes, this is our audit results report for the audit of the 1920 accounts. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that we are substantially complete with the work that we need to um, do to be able to provide you with a, an audit opinion and um, subject to a small number of areas that are still outstanding, which Mr. Russell will take us through in a moment. Um, we anticipate issuing an unqualified um, audit opinion on the financial statements. We will, in our um, reference to value for money, include a qualified conclusion on the arrangements um, in place during the year of 1920, and it, it will probably be um, of no um, great surprise to the committee that that will again be around the arrangements that were in place during the year to be able to produce and uh, publish financial statements in accordance with the regulations um, and the timing set out in, in those. Um, because we have, uh, as I say, talked um, at some length about some of those difficulties that were experienced at that point and therefore the knock-on impact as to why we're reporting at this stage for um, the 1920 um, financial year. So the, on page um, five, we set out some background um, and context as to you know, the trajectory of improvement that the organization has been on in terms of being able to improve its processes to produce financial statements and also to respond and, um, to the audit queries. And I am pleased to say that you know, we have seen quite a marked improvement over just the life of this audit as well. So just every now and again, we do get into a position where um, there's you know, some clarity needed, some explanation as to quite what we're looking for, but officers have worked really closely with us. And even in the last um, couple of weeks since producing the report, we've made some substantial progress. Um, so, you know, the team is to be commended for their work and their support to the audit to get us to this position. Um, I'll just take you on to our page six and seven, which highlights the work that we've done against the significant risks that we'd identified in our audit plan and 
um, the conclusion of each of those areas. And you'll note, um, in particular, there are, there are three areas that I wanted to bring to your attention where we have identified um, that adjustments are required to the uh, statement of accounts, which we anticipate management will put through on the final version. Um, so on capital accounting entries, we did identify one order adjustment of 1.808 million um, that needs to be um, adjusted. Um, on valuations of investment property, there's an adjustment um, of um, 0.8 million that um, requires to be put through. And um, we've also identified on valuation of other land and buildings and housing assets, um, one audit difference of 0.858 million um, in terms of housing uh, assets that needs to be adjusted. But as I say, we anticipate that management will put those through. So perhaps if I hand over to um, Mark to just to talk us through the, the last few areas that are outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, so if you, um, so at the back of our report, so from page 50 is the status of our audit. So this follows on from the, the report and the progress we, were, we, um, we brought to committee pre-Christmas. So if I just take you through where we are with those items, that should give you a, a, the position of the audit as it stands. So on page 53, um, these are the audit procedures substantially completed. So this report was, was written at the back end, mid to back end of last week. So we have made progress against these items now. Uh, so just working down briefly then. So the um, provisions line, we are still trying to finalize this area, in particular the provision raised around the North Stow and on NNDR appeals provision, we have queries still remaining with the council to respond to. Um, the group accounts we've now completed, and there's no findings to report to this committee. We've completed the next section down, which is the disclosures. So this includes exit packages and senior officers' remunerations. Again, this work's now complete with nothing to report. Um, HRA expenditure, we are awaiting some payroll information to be able to complete this work um, from officers. Uh, the reserves, two reserve sections, we are, haven't completed that work yet because we're waiting for an updated set of accounts because some of the adjustments that are required to the accounts have a, a, an impact on those reserves and the movements in them. Uh, creditors, the only outstanding areas and recorded liabilities testing, and again, this is with um, the council and we're waiting for a response on those. Related parties, this work is finished and there's nothing to report in regards to the related parties work. And then if we move to page 54, so the bad debt provision, again, now completed, nothing to report. Employee costs, we have some queries outstanding with management, again, and we're waiting for responses on those to allow us to finish that work. And the disclosure checklist, again, we need the updated version of the accounts to rerun the disclosure checklist to make sure it's in line with the SIPFA code of practice. And then the final page of 55, so those elements that are listed out there, we, we can't complete at this point until the rest of the work's finished as standard process. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very helpful and clear update on um, exactly where we stand today. Um, do members of the committee, uh, well, first of all, uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Maddock, did, did you want to make any comments at this stage before I open uh, to the committee for questions? Um, not particularly other than to echo what's been said, uh, I think, you know, um, the work that we've done and the work that the audit has done, communication has improved quite significantly, but I think we do recognise there still were one or two issues where there was a little bit of clarification required, but otherwise uh, I think it's a fair reflection pretty much. Okay. Thank you, Mr Maddock. Uh, Councillor Howell and then Councillor Williams, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Just the one question, is, and it's directed towards, um, well, I'm going to say Mr Maddox, but that end of the table, shall I say, that number. Uh, not you, Patrick, you're okay, you're safe on this one. Um, uh, with regards to um, what was commented upon with regards to 53, and some of the um, outstanding audits are waiting for information from the Council. With what you know at the moment, do you foresee any issues or any problems uh, given that information to the auditors, or is the information just there, it's just getting the staff time to do it? Thank you, Chairman. No, I don't see any issues at all. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. You'll be pleased to know that my list is shorter than normal. Um, first of all, can I just ask, following on from Councillor Howe's question about what we're waiting for, I heard things about payroll. 
Um, I don't know if we have that in house <coughs> or it's, it's you're right there. Um, we don't know if we have it in house or external. So I'm just wondering, in any of these occasions, is it a third party that we're requiring information from? Because obviously that can have you know make it a bit harder to to meet deadlines. But hopefully it'll all be in house. Um, secondly, on page forty. Um, about the 2018-19 fees, if we've got an idea when we might have a final determination date from either EY or ourselves, I'd very much appreciate an answer to it. Um, and we have the, the scale fee and some assurance from EY that the fees won't be as high this year on the basis of what they've seen so far. Um, and lastly, Chair, um, it was very nice to hear of the team being commended the way they're working. We don't always get to hear that, and it was a nice uh, surprise and change, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Uh, Mr. Maddock, perhaps you can pick up on the uh, external, uh, on the, the extent which we're relying on third parties. Yes. <clears throat> so um, a number of the queries are, are HR related, so they will be providing the information. Um, we may need some information from payroll. Uh, or a shared service with the city, but uh, I don't anticipate having any real issues getting that information. Um, okay. Um, uh, fees. Uh, yes, did you, I, I believe we were going to cover this under the matter as a topical interest. Do you want to keep it there, or do you want to...? Um, I mean, I was in contact with the PSAA yesterday to get an update. Um, they still do have one or two things to iron out, so they haven't quite finished. Um, I did also ask them about um, the level of work that they're undertaking, just out of interest, really. Uh, and they, have, they are saying that you know, there are a number of... They're working through a number of similar issues with other authorities as well. I, don't, you know, I think just, just to say, I think they have got quite a lot of these sort of ongoing issues with others as well, so it's not just us. But he did endeavour to get the information sorted out as soon as he possibly can. Thank you. Um, did you want to come back on any of those points, Councillor Williams, or shall I move on to other members? Thank you, Chair. Just one that was probably for EY to answer about going forward. It references fees and whether we should expect to see a lower fee based on what they've seen for the 2020 accounts. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate you haven't started your audit plan yet uh, for the following year, but um, is there any comment you'd like to make to the committee on uh, the future sort of likely <laughs> level of fees? Thanks, Chair. I think um, Councillor Williams was asking about the 1920 fees as well, weren't you? The, the, this one, yeah. That, uh, so we don't anticipate that they'll be of the same scale as 19, as 1819, given the, the change in the system that had taken place for the uh, financial, the sorry, the the um, asset register, which caused a lot of the difficulties. Um, and so, uh, you know, you'll note from our exceptions that we've identified just two adjustments within the um, fixed assets and the uh, investment properties this year rather than a whole raft last year. So we don't anticipate to see the same scale, but we're not quite finished yet. So once we've done that, we'll then share our estimate with Mr. Maddock. And then let's see what happens for 2021. Thank you, Chair. I shall, in that case, hold my breath in hope that uh, the fees will be reduced this year. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Leeming, I, I believe you indicated to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have one very specific question, please, for the auditors, um, which is, do they have an idea of when this work will be completed? Like, is it just weeks or days? How, how much time do you think um, will be needed, please? Um, second thing is, I would like to echo um, people's comments that they're very pleased to have confirmation that things have improved. I think that's a really good, a good sign for all of us, and I'd like to thank the officers for their work. Um, my final point is relating to a comment on page 34, um, which is in the area of um, the assessment of the control environment and recommendations. Um, there's a sentence which says that the auditors would recommend the re-evaluation and communication of the priority and importance of the financial reporting function of the council. Um, I would like to object to this comment. I think that it's unjust. I think that all members, all officers, and particularly members of this committee are, are well aware of the importance of the financial reporting function 
and we will do all we can to support it. Uh, thank you. Um, perhaps you could clarify what was meant by that comment and maybe uh, there may be a form of words that uh, could perhaps express that differently. Certainly. Um, more than happy to um, just explain what we were concerned about, which was, you know, through, through the audit, the, the emphasis that has been placed on um, the, the time and the resource available to be able to produce quality accounts and then to support the audit. And we have seen, a, as I said, a marked improvement. But I think that it's important that the organisation, and, and we've already agreed that we will work with the finance team to do this, we, we need a wash up to understand how far they've come, why they were in that position, how that far they've come and what further improvements they need to make on that. So I think we're on a journey. I don't think that we're out of the woods yet. And that's why we've continue to um, emphasize the point around the prioritization of financial reporting. It's not unique to South Cams. It's you know, an issue that quite a lot of district councils are struggling with, or councils are struggling with at the moment. But I think it's important. It's only going to become more important. And there's a lot of emphasis across the stakeholder um, community for local government that that is going to be important. So I, I would like to keep that emphasis within our report. But I'm happy to look at the wording. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to, um, if there's a way that we can write this that expands that and explains that um, that detail, that would be helpful. But I would also like admitting that um, we are all aware of the importance of the financial reporting function of the council. Thanks. Uh, thank you, councillor. Yes, I, th I think probably, um, I think perhaps in the in the final audit report, if you can expand to the extent, and you know, I, I think what you said just now about um, you know this is a council that's been on a journey and clearly. I think uh, at the, uh, sort of in the, in the genesis of our current problems was um, a kind of redeployment of resources in the pandemic uh, for kind of good and, and kind of sound reasons. Um, and it, I, I, th I think, it, I think I th yes, I, th I think something expanded that captured some more of that con sort of nuance uh, would be welcomed by, that by the committee if you can put that in place. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Stobart. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in this, as in other projects, you know, which involve corporate cooperation of multiple parties, um, we talked about improvements in organisational performance, but I think there's also improvements and changes in relationships, working relationships as, as part of that. Um, we did mention, uh, I think we mentioned the wash-up. I think, um, uh, Janet, you mentioned a wash-up session. Um, it would be great to know that lessons learned had been, as it were, noted and actioned. Um, and I, I, I don't know, is it my place as a member of the committee to say we would be interested to get a, a kind of an appreciation of that at a future meeting? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Yes, I think um, that, so uh, plans for a kind of wash-up meeting at the end of this audit um, uh, a, a sort of forming, essentially. Um, you know, there's no kind of date and there's no schedule as yet. Um, but it's a, a priority of mine that some kind of um, yeah, wash-up session occurs after this audit. Um, and I will be keeping committee members informed about that. And there may well be ways for uh, the committee to participate in that as, in that as well, um, to the extent that committee members uh, wish to. Um, uh, so yeah, so more, more more detail forthcoming. Obviously, at the moment, the priority is finishing it, um, and then uh, and but then, as you say, there are there are going to be lessons learned, and I think it's important that those are reflected on. Um, Councillor Williams, I believe you you indicated. Thank you. I, I would just say that it sounds like Councillor Stobart is asking for support with a toolkit, perhaps, of audit efficiency. It sounded very very familiar, um, so I I thank him for the uh, backup on that one. Um, and just to echo what Councillor Leeming said about um, the seriousness that councillors take, um, we do take our roles very seriously. We do them to the best of our ability. Um, and we put the council as objectives first. We may have different ideas as to what is best for the council, but that is the focus. And I think any commentary or anything that would defer from that would be inaccurate, unhelpful, um, and, you know, just not, not acceptable. We are accountable to residents. If they don't like what we're doing, they can vote us out. That's why we have democratic process. Um, something that uh, I was reminded is you're only in this job for as long as your residents will put up with you. So I think that's quite, a, quite enough judgment to be had on us. 
and I'll trust my residents. And I don't think that any language suggesting otherwise is appropriate. So I'd echo the comments of Councillor Mooney. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, if there are no further comments, there's one or two quick issues that I would like to raise. Um, can you just confirm, uh, uh, auditors, for me, um, where there have been uh, material corrections to the accounts? Have you undertaken further work in those areas? And are you satisfied that those, are the, that those differences have arisen as a result of a, a kind of a one-off mistake rather than anything more uh, systematic? Yes, thank you, Chair. So, um, I think, as um, Janet alluded to, some of the key findings we've had have been in PPE again. So, the, the misstatement of the 1.08 million uh, was driven by um, a posting that shouldn't have happened to a fixed asset register. So, we, we undertook further work to, to assess that no similar errors had, had crept into that process. And the findings of that are that there was we couldn't identify any other um, adjustments that have been inappropriately posted to the fixed asset register. Uh, the other ad adjustment to the fixed asset register is just around the classification. So that's the 0 0.8 million pound balance. So that's the classification of it within how it sits within the comprehensive income and expenditure statement. So it, essentially it just needs moving down from the top half of the statement down to the bottom. And that is a one-off item which just records the loss on valuation of investment properties. So in that respect, it is an isolated issue. And in regards to the, the, the smaller items, should we say where we're looking for adjustment, again, our testing shows that there's no other um, errors in those balances. Thank you. That's, um, I, f I find that, that very reassuring. Obviously, these are a complex set of accounts and the accounts are involved in a wide range of uh, businesses. So, you know, errors do creep in and it's, uh, it's good that uh, these were found, but I'm, I'm glad that there's not evidence of any further issues in those areas. Um, I had one uh, very quick question, perhaps, for Mr. Maddock. Um, you noted, I think, uh, one of the corrections were some, um, some beacon assets that had not been revalued during 1920 because uh, I think something around, you know, the construction had finished, they'd moved class, and they hadn't been um, passed to the external valuers. I, I wonder, have these assets... Have these assets since uh, been valued um, for kind of a, a more kind of up to date uh, number? I'm, I'm just concerned there's a small chance they might have, uh, you know, never got back on the list, as it were. Um, so I wonder. I don't need an update now on it, so it could come after the committee. If, yeah, no problems. We'll, we'll we'll come back to that outside of committee. Any final comments on the uh, the audit update? Fantastic. So uh, we will await your final audit report and indeed the final accounts. Um, depending on when those are ready, we'll either take those at our March meeting or if it's appropriate, um, we may schedule an additional short meeting with one item on it um, just to um, approve those. Um, but I will be in contact with members. Um, I, I, rather than try and schedule something now, I think when we know that everything is you know, every, every T crossed and I dotted, then we will consider the most appropriate way to um, uh, process that through this committee and give it our uh, approval. I assume you're not required to formally make this report. Uh, I think, let's, uh, let me... Say so on the agenda. Yes, uh, we've been asked to note uh, this report uh, and discuss it, which indeed we have. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the Mr. Young representatives for joining us in person today. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, agenda item five is the uh, annual governance statement and the local code of governance. Uh, may I ask uh, Mr. Tully to please present this report. Thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to take you through some of the highlights of the report. Um, we're now starting off on page 11 of your main committee packs. So by way of a background, the accounts and audit regulations require the council to review its governance arrangements on a regular basis. And we prepare an annual governance statement, which I sometimes refer to as the acronym AGS, um, to accompany the statement of accounts. And the purpose of the annual governance statement, it's to communicate how we are complying with a local code of governance, which I've also um, brought to you today. 
it's definitely worth uh, talking to you about sort of timing of these documents. Um, the annual governance statement should reflect governance statements uh, and matters in the financial year. So we're looking at 2020, 2021, plus also up to the date that the accounts are signed and concluded. So it does include quite a broad time period. The previous uh, annual governance statement, 2019-2020, uh, was approved by yourselves at the committee less than six months ago. So it's probably not too much of a surprise that the governance arrangements have stayed very consistent within that time period. However, despite being a short period between this document, it's a great opportunity to actually look back at what we did in that financial year and try and capture some of the, the things we've done which have contributed to the governance environments. And we do that in the thing that's called the uh, the section that's called the review of effectiveness. Um, so um, the report um, talks about the AGS uh, on page 13, and I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of navigation around the committee pack. Um, the statement itself is on pages 133 to 149 of your agenda packs. Hopefully you can find that OK. Um, because it's included in the statement of accounts, and there's quite a lot of pages today, we didn't want to include it twice, because if anyone did want to print the packs out, that'd be a lot of paperwork. Um, but it is important that we have a separate agenda item to highlight that it needs to be approved in advance of the statement of accounts. And that's because it's a legislative requirement. So that's why we have that up first. So with your approval, we can um, progress the documents and it will then be reviewed by the external auditors as part of the statement of accounts work. It's worth noting that should something material be identified as part of that review, we would want to include it and we, of course, update the committee. So, yes, the annual governance statement itself uh, starts on page 133 of your packs, and I just want to draw out some of the key points of it. On pages 137, uh, we have roles and responsibilities, and that's always a very important section because that sets out the key sort of roles within the organisation that contribute to the governance environment. There have been no significant changes from the previous report there. Um, moving on, page 140, I just want, I just want to highlight these, the external audit section. We do uh, reference that when uh, work has been done by the external auditors, because it is a form of assurance, um, just to note that there is a highlighted section there um, with regards to the results report, because when I prepared this, we didn't know the date that it was going to come to the committee. But of course, we can now update that. So that'll be updated in the final version of the statement of accounts. Also on page 140, one thing which is perhaps new to previous years is the financial management code. This is a new requirement that brings together a lot of existing guidance um, for accountancy in the public sector, and it's about making sure there's adequate financial resilience. So it brings together a lot of existing standards. Um, councils are required to be compliant from the next financial year, which is 21-22, um, but this year was a shadow year, so um, the council had to start preparing for that. Um, what I'm pleased to say, um, because um, we've moved on since that date, we can already review that we are report that we're compliant with that and my team as internal auditors have completed an independent review um, so we can provide that assurance that we are compliant with the code and we reported that to the committee in one of our previous update reports um, in the last year so that's a positive um, also on page 140 is the impact of uh, the coronavirus um, this is an example of where we have to recognize significant events which happen outside of the financial year. And you would have noted that we included that in our previous report for 2019-20. Um, but of course, this was a, a big year for the pandemic and it continues into the following financial year as well. So we continue to make reference to that. On page 141, we like to uh, include an update since the previous statement that was brought to you. Um, it was just five months ago, so there have not been uh, lots of radical changes since that last report. Um, there are four items um, there, and the last two, I would say, are continue to be work in progress. Um, resources still continue to be a risk which needs to be managed in the public sector, and also financial reporting we've spoken about already. Um, so they will continue as open actions, and that's perfectly acceptable. That's fine. 
On page 142, um, we get into the review of effectiveness. And just as a refresher, this is where we look back at what happened in the financial year and capture some of those highlights. And what we like to do is group them by the actual principles of, uh, of the code of governance. So that helps us perform a gap analysis and make sure that we are contributing across all of those areas. So that's where you'll see those groups by the different principles. Um, then on page 148, um, this is where we talk about um, opportunities for improvements and what could be happening over the sort of next 12 months. And then finally, we get to page 149, which is the conclusion and opinion. And that's where we note that we have in place strong governance arrangements. That takes us to the end of the annual governance statement. But I also want to talk about the local code of governance, um, which accompanies it. So to take you back to page 13, I'll give you a moment to get there of our uh, agenda pack, I think. Yes, um, that's where I introduced the local code of governance. Um, this is a document which is continually updated uh, by uh, the council. Um, it's an opportunity to really sort of codify, draw together lots of good practice and documents and policies which help contribute to a positive governance environment. So we'd like to keep it updated. Um, I'd say some things will get picked up in real time. I do my best to stay on top of that. And some things will get picked up through the review of effectiveness that we complete through the annual governance statements. So that's good. It's a two way process. It's good to stay on top of it. We don't want it to sit on the shelf and be ignored. Um, so we bring it back to the committee as good practice. It's on page 18 of your packs. Um, and what we've done just for, for ease of reference for your we've used track changes um, just to highlight where we have made changes or additions. Um, I think it's just additions on this occasion. Um, so to quickly highlight those page 18, we recognise that we now have an ethical handbook. It's really good to include that in as a source of assurance because that really contributes well to that first principle A about ethics. On page 23 of the packs, there's two items there. We include the corporate asset plan and also the zero carbon strategy because those were introduced in the uh, financial year. Um, yeah, and I think that's all of the changes. But the one thing I always like to promote, although there's been no changes to it, is uh, on page 33, towards the end of the document, we have the seven principles of public life. Um, a very important thing that we all have to follow as uh, either members or officers in the public sector. So I always like to promote that. So in summary, um, for clarity, members, you have to uh, approve the annual governance statements in advance of the statement of accounts. That's why it's on the uh, agenda as a separate item. Um, we've just approved the previous one less than six months ago, um, but it's been a great opportunity to go through and see what we did in 2020, 2021. Um, it accompanies the statement of accounts, which are later in the pack. That's all I want to say, and I'm happy to take comments or questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Tully. Um, I believe, uh, Councillor Williams, you wanted to ask a question? Um, well, a, a appreciation, actually, because we've got track changes, which we haven't always had. So thank you very much, Mr. Tully, for taking that on board, because I did used to tear my hair out a little bit trying to match where we changed and where we hadn't. Um, I'm sure others will, will have um, comments and what have you, but overall, you know, it's, it's very similar to what we've seen before, and I'm happy to proceed with it and um, allow officers to get uh, a nice replacement for the yellow question marks on page 140. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm sure sometimes we, we, this is more of a test to see if we read it, and that's why we... Um, uh, to show we've actually read it. So on page, I think it's uh, 42, you have a small reference there to Camborne. I think the uh, the population of Camborne has increased slightly, so maybe that should be updated, please. Um, and also on page 137, you have some scrutiny and overview, which was already put out. Can we have something about the overview part of the scrutiny and overview committee as well, please? We always say about the scrutiny, we always forget about its poor, poor relation, the overview section. And that's all I ask. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Mr. Tully, are you happy to um, expand that section slightly in the uh, annual government statement? I think we can delegate that to you to do uh, with our approval. Um, are there yes, any please. other comments from councillors on either the local code of government? Uh, Councillor Stobart. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's, 
it's obviously a, a key um, document, uh, and um, you know it's 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 well presented, um, but I find it quite linear. Uh, as a document, it's quite linear. It is a list of what does the council do, and what is the supporting evidence, and um, quite a lot of what the council does. In fact, probably true of, of all working systems tends to be somewhat iterative with feedback loops and uh, corrective processes. Now, you can't capture that in a document like this. This is a document which says the states, a purpose, and the supporting evidence. But I wonder if there's a possibility, because the word communication was used, we communicate um, the integrity of the council's actions through a document like this. But could we think of um, a, a, a set of, and it needn't be, anything huge, but a set of infographics which captures some of this um, so that it could be easily explained. And it wouldn't be necessarily part of this document, it would be an appendix. Um, but um, it does, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's hard to read because in our function as, as, as counsellors, we, you know, we have to digest material like this and tease the real meaning out. But for a wider communication of the integrity of the council's activity, it might be nice to have some, in a sense, graphical presentation. So that's my first point. Um, second um, is version numbering. So we, we did mention that um, uh, there is track changes, and that's great. And if we probe deeper, we could find by whom and when that uh, change was made. Um, but is there a need for a version system, uh, or is this every year? And so we just simply refer to the, as it were, 2022 version. Uh, of the document. And then finally, just um, I, it, it's more a point of curiosity, so I just have to relate a, a short story. In uh, JDCC, we were reviewing one of the uh, design codes for a new development, and um, the design code is, is, this particular one was really very nicely structured, and so more like a contractual document in, in which the words should and must are used um, in their contractual sense. So must, it has to be should. Uh, it would have to be, but with, uh, with um, a justification for not. Um, so I was just looking at the seven principles of public life, and if, you know, it does use should and must. Uh, and I wondered, uh, in reading this, it just got my antennae going you know, with respect to those two contractual words. So that, uh, for example, it says the holders of public office should act solely in terms of the public interest, for example. So is, is that implying should meaning generally yes, but sometimes there is a need perhaps to uh, you know, not report something because it's confidential to a person, for example. So I was just interested, and that's more interest than a kind of a deep comment, uh, but I, I just uh, value a, a comment uh, from Mr. Tully on that point. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Tully, perhaps, uh, perhaps you can address some of the comments that the council has made. Thank you, thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, Councillor Stobart. Um, yeah, I suppose to go through uh, those in logical order. Um, communication of these documents is something which I, I agree with you and I fully support. We need to do whatever we can to make them accessible. Um, the, the original sort of guidance for producing these documents many years ago was very, you really should follow this standard for producing them. And it wasn't the most perhaps inviting or interesting or engaging way of presenting the documents. So we've continually worked to improve those. Um, so no, I fully support what you're saying. I think if, I, if we manage to get some time to do infographics, that would be helpful. Um, I think what I just come back as a point of clarification. Um, would you prefer infographics on, should we say, the first document, the annual governance statement, or was it more the code of governance, the second one, which you would find more useful, or both? <laughs> Um, well, if, if I could choose, uh, that's, uh, that's great. Um, no, the, uh, the, 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 the principal document in the pack, the, uh, as it were, the, the working document for, for the council. Fabulous, okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to look into that. Um, I think the, the second point with the version numbering on the, the code of governance, um, it's something I, I could look into doing, but really, yes, it's whenever we bring an update to the committee, there's a formal record in the minutes that it's been updated. So there is that formal record there. Um, typically, I, you know, I would bring it 
most likely every year to the committee when we're in a normal cycle of doing statement of accounts and uh, the annual governance statements. Um, the only time I wouldn't bring it if there'd be no changes um, because we wouldn't want to waste the paper. But yeah, so th there is a sort of version numbering in place. Um, and I think you, the third point um, was around the, the should and must. And you're referring to comments there in the seven principles of public life. Um, I suppose my first response to that would be that we've taken that from uh, the actual sort of Nolan committee. So that's not our words. So we're probably not at liberty to change those. Um, but I think it is a, an interesting uh, point that you raise. I, I, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Um, so probably the brief answer to that is no, it's not something we can change, but I would happy to have a discussion with people offline about it, if they found it useful. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, it, it's a, I think it's a curiosity. Uh, you know, my original comment about the, um, the, the design code, there was an essential way of communicating between the local planning authority and the developer, but here it's arguably a different kind of relationship. It would be intriguing to find out why the Mullen uh, report actually chose those those words. What's, what's the background? But I think mm. um, as councillors, we quite understand you know, the importance of openness and, and we would probably interpret it as a must rather than a should. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, my, my suspicion is that it was written uh, you know, in sort of communicative language rather than contractual language. And so I would interpret the shoulds and musts pretty... Uh, equivocally, but um, you know they're there to guide us definitely. Um, Councillor Williams, I believe you wanted to uh, come in. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm receptive to Councillor Stobart's comments um, on design. I think it would be interesting to see a new format, but I would be quite keen for that to happen with the next set of counts rather than changes to this. Because what we're voting on today, obviously, is if he's agreeable. Because we're sort of we're so close now with this. Um, <laughs> Oh, if I'm quite honest, and but going forward, and I've always seen this as very much like a live document, which we we pause in a moment in time to include in the accounts, but it is ever evolving to the circumstances. Um, in relation to the principles of public life, that is for all of government, civil service, and everything. So I don't think we can really change that. And I think, um, as you say, it's it's for us to interpret and act as we feel feel we should. But just as an example on the openness, it's so important to be open and transparent about everything that we do. But there are times to protect the um, rights of an individual, for example, um, or we do, there are genuine reasons why we have to go into closed sessions sometimes, or it might be contractual reasons. So I think that may be there for those incidents. If you, if we, this is ethics, not rules. And I think if we were prescriptive, then it's a rule-based <coughs> system. And that is a bit of a can of worms, Chair. Um, but I think the ethics of which the seven principles of public life, same as if you have a professional body, we have professional ethics, which essentially is what this is, um, should be looked at and strongly supported by us. So you, you have my sentiment, Councillor Stobar, but I, I think there is probably justification for allowing leniency in some spaces to protect the rights of individuals. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I think just on the, just for myself on the on the design piece, I think as uh, as these formal documents uh, kind of catch up to the present day, I think the communication, you know, the. The potential for these as a communication tool for the council will increase. I appreciate there may not be a great deal of interest in the, you know, in the, the, the sort of the statement of our financial balances sort of two years ago. But I am dreaming of the day when it'll be a slightly more uh, timely document. And at that point, it may be, it, it may be an important part of the way that this council communicates, uh, you know, with its residents, with its suppliers, with its, uh, with all of its other stakeholders. Um, and I think already in this statement of account, overall statement of accounts, we've seen quite a marked uh, improvement in kind of format and uh, style, and I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that. Um, but I think, so I, it would be good to see the annual governance statement and indeed the local code of governance kind of keeping up with that progress as well um, and looking to find ways to make this a document that um, can draw people in through a kind of variety of media. But we will leave, those, we will leave you with those thoughts. Um, 
I had one uh, detailed comment I'd just like to raise, which is on uh, page 23. Um, unfortunately, one of my, one of my pet, uh, pet bugbears, I'm afraid, um, talking about the, the zero carbon strategy. Um, so having read it a few times, it, 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 it does become clear to me, but I think we've got to be very careful that we distinguish between when we're talking about the emissions that the council as an organization emits and when we're talking about the emissions uh, from the kind of the, the population of the area which the council kind of represents. Um, and I think perhaps um, maybe just look at some of the language there and just make sure it's absolutely clear who is, who is cutting what by when. Um, because obviously it matters as to the degree, you know, we have the most control over our own emissions and uh, a different role to play in um, how we affect the emissions of the, of the wider community. Um, so that's just a little, a little bugbear of mine to just, to just to make that as clear as we can. But as you say, this is an iterative document and we look forward to the latest versions with track changes. Um, and I think perhaps a version number or some kind of versioning on the front page of it would be appreciated by the committee, I do agree but just something so we can, we can keep track and refer back as well as, even if it's just the date at which it was presented, perhaps, or something like that would be, would be helpful. Um, are there any final comments on the annual governance statement or local code, code of governance? No, in that case, I move that we um, approve the annual governance statement. Um, we have a second. Seconded by the vice chair, approved. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes item five. Thank you, Mr. Tully, for presenting today. Uh, item six is the draft set of accounts for 2021, which uh, feels like a year that was quite recent, so we must be doing something right. Um, could I please ask uh, Mr. Maddock to present his report? Thank you. <coughs> so, um, We've got uh, before you the 2021 draft statement of accounts. Um, it has got a slightly different feel and look to it. Um, my colleague Sanjeev Sital, who is on this uh, call, has been instrumental in um, getting it a, a, a much improved way of doing the accounts and uh, getting the information in. Uh, and I think, I think committee members will probably agree um, and I think it was mentioned earlier <clears throat> that it is, you know, it, it does, in my opinion, look rather better than, than perhaps the previous couple have. Um, as regards the accounts themselves, um, you'll see on page 51 to 54 what we call the core statements. So those are the uh, comprehensive income and expenditure statement, the movement and reserve statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. And as I say, they're referred to as the core statements. So um, I've put in a little bit of commentary about some of the key figures within those statements. But for example, on page 51, there's a line there about four up from the bottom called surplus stroke deficit on provision of services. And you'll see there's a significant surplus showing there. Um, now that was um, due, due to primarily due to an increase in the valuation of our investment properties. Um, but because that is a, um, a valuation increase, we cannot charge that against the council tax. So in the statement on the following page, that item has to be reversed out so it doesn't have any overall impact on our general fund. So whilst it, uh, the statement on page 51 shows all of our income and expenditure, as the name suggests, it's not the full position when we start looking at the overall council balances on its general fund and housing revenue account. Um, the balance sheet on page 53, there's a, there's a number of uh, movements there um, that are reasonably significant. Uh, we've seen an increase in our value of our property, plant and equipment. Um, again, um, much of that is our council dwellings, so we've seen an, an increase in the values there. I previously mentioned um, investment properties. Um, we've also seen an increase in uh, uh, sundry debtors and, and prepayments and, and um, where are we? creditors. A lot of that was COVID related. We received grants in advance. We also, uh, we also had income from central government in advance of when 
we were going to uh, be spending it. So uh, the creditors and debtors have changed somewhat, but that, a lot of that is to do with the pandemic. Um, also, again, the pensions reserve, for example, that's, that's, to go, that's based on a lot of assumptions. Some of those assumptions change with time and, for example, um, during the pandemic, returns from um, property and investments were expected to fall because of the situation we had then. So that has affected the liability. Um, there are a number of notes uh, to the statement of accounts uh, and they just give a little bit more detail behind uh, particular items within either the um, comprehensive income expenditure statement, cash flow or, or the um, balance sheet. Um, we also um, we also have a housing revenue account because we are in a, a stock holding local authority, so we have to account for that separately to our general fund. And um, we've also got something called the collection fund, which is where we account for uh, the collection of business rates and council tax and the distribution of those to preceptors. Um, so that's the accounts as they, as they stand. They've been published on our website and they're, they're currently going through the public inspection process, which is due to end, I think, on the 7th of February. Um, if there's any, if there was any questions or comments in relation to those accounts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mallock. Uh, Councillor Williams, I believe you indicated you wanted to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start off with a, a couple of, sort of main questions. I do have a, some very, very minor sort of um, typographical or rounding, which with your permission, Chair, I'll, I'll convey to Mr Maddox outside the meeting. I don't think we need to debate uh, a, an extra space or two. Um, but on page 44 and 45, just wanted to discuss the um, charts. Now, I will say that it is much improved, I think, in much more accessible um, format of accounts, so that's very welcome. <coughs> Uh, I just if we look at page 44 to begin with um, we've got the five columns uh, with the fourth column to going left to right uh, difference to act, actual to outturn but we don't call we've got a reported outturn a revised outturn and I just think from a public access uh, position it'd be helpful if we called it actual outturn and reported outturn rather than revised so then when people are looking at the difference it's really clear which columns are actually being um, compared and again with the variance perhaps something that that in brackets says we we know it's actual from budget but something that explains it for an accessibility point of view um, equally on page 45 we've gone down to four columns um, and it would be really lovely, maybe it's me just liking things to match. Um, I am guilty of that. Um, but it'd be nice if we had the fifth column as well with the difference, as well as the variance, so that we can... Chairman, I'm very, very sorry, but I think if the paper copy and the electronic copy are not matching up. That... Have a look at these ones, Mark. No, 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 but it's not only going to be for me, but if we're all going to be working, it's supposed to be on. Um, I don't, we, on, on which page have you noticed a difference? Sorry, can I, uh, I'm, I'm on page 45. Am I on the right one? Yeah, it's, you're on that little. Is it something else? Chair, if I refer to both large number and okay, little number. Okay, I'll open now, but Chairman, in the future, can we just have one medium that we use? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll catch up. Okay. Yeah. Right, so I'm referring to page 44, large number, page 3, little number. Right, go on, carry on. I'll carry on. Ah, that, that has highlighted the fact that we go from page 3, little number, to page 1, little number, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is, um, that, is, that, is, that is on all of them. I don't yeah. think that's going to help us either in this situation. Um, all right, so let, let, let's refer to the, the central numbers at the bottom for the whole agenda. Pack. And I'll share with Mark for this, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, do continue, Councillor Williams. 
Okay, thank you, Chair. So can we, we'll put checking of numbers on, on our list, perhaps, would be advisable. Um, I'm really worried about saying what page now. So page 51, which is little page six, that might not be where page six is. Um, I just wanted to um, ask in relation to the Chief Executive and Chief Operating Officer budget, just that it's quite a significant drop. Um, if we could have some explanation around that. Um, and then later on, we do refer to cash and cash equivalents on page 56, little 11. Uh, it refers to, on 1.3, that the figures are net of bank overdrafts. I just think it would be helpful to know what overdrafts, what value of overdrafts we have actually available to us, because um, that may help with things, Chair, just to get an idea of what, uh, what we do have available, really, because it's something that we don't often get reported on. Uh, I think that's it, and like I say, minor things which I'll go through with the team afterwards, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, uh, Mr. Maddock, are you happy to pick up on, on some of those questions? I, I wonder for the overdraft in particular whether um, that's something to include broken out in the next time we look at the kind of treasury management side of things um, and see the size, yeah, see the cash holdings and see the, uh, the real and available overdrafts as, as separate items. But perhaps you'd like to uh, come in on some of the other comments that uh, Councillor Williams made. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the tables in 44 and 45, there does seem to be a bit of inconsistency there. So I'm sure we can pick that up and get that sorted out. That's, that's fine. Obviously, the numbering seems to have gone a bit weird for some reason. But yeah, we'll get that sorted out. Thank you. I appreciate there was some interruption in the middle there. Have we captured all of your earlier points that you wanted to raise? Um, I did ask about the drop in the Chief Executive, Chief Operating Officer budget and the overdrafts, but overdrafts might need to be uh, given another time. <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, do, do, you have an, do you have an answer to hand for the change in the uh, Chief Executive and Chief Operating Officer line? Um, don't think we do. Let, we'll, we'll have a look at that and get back to the committee on that. But can't think off the top of my head, but it's probably something we can lay our hands on pretty quickly. Thank you. Um, ah, I think, in fact, the Chief Executive perhaps would like to... Well, well I can't actually answer the question, but all I can say is that I arrived during that year, so in, so the structure changed quite considerably between the previous structure and the old structure, so I imagine it's wrapped up in those changes, but I can't be more specific than that, I'm afraid, Councillor Williams. Thank you. That's a, that's a helpful clarification. Um, I'm, I'm happy to receive an answer by uh, circulation after the meeting. Um, did you want to come back in, Councillor Williams? Thank you, Chair. Yes, that would be very helpful because it is sort of a million pounds. It's not a small figure, so that would be really appreciated if someone could just look into that. Because given the size of variance, it may be advisable to put a note or something saying, for example, there's been a change um, to give some form of explanation. Thank you. Yes, I think that would be uh, appropriate. Um, are there any comments from other members of the committee? Oh, Councillor Sanford. Thank you, Chair. Um, the increase in pensions liability is quite eye-catching. I appreciate there were extenuating circumstances and the liability will not crystallise any time soon, but I'm wondering if someone is actually monitoring this liability to make sure the council's um, pension liability doesn't get out of control. Uh, 36, um, paragraph 12 at the bottom of the page. Yes, thank you, Councillor Sam, but I had, I had that noted as well. I mean, I, I wonder if we can have, I mean, I, I don't know if you have this, but what the, the kind of the latest valuation. Um, and, and in general, obviously, I think it seems to be a liability that is incredibly volatile and changing a lot from year to year. And, and how, do, how do the council officers kind of incorporate that into their thinking about the council's sort of financial sustainability? I mean, I mean, it is an interesting one, and that is a, a, a fair point. I mean, the volatility is significant. Um, a lot of the, a, a lot of the valuations, the, sorry, the elements within it are, are based on assumptions going forward quite a lot of years. So, even quite small um, adjustments to assumptions can have quite 
significant impacts on the figures themselves. We get, uh, with, with each um, uh, set of accounts, we get a um, valuation report from the actuaries. So, so each year they go through, they look at the assumptions, they look at the figures. So we have quite a detailed report, which um, our EY can get a chance to look at and comment on as well. Um, we also have a tri I can't say this word, triennial um, valuation of our pension fund. So that's carried out um, every three years. Have a look at the assets and liabilities. So we'll be getting the results of that. Or we just had the results of that, haven't we? Yeah. So we've just had the results of the latest trade evaluation. So there's quite a lot of sort of um, control over um, where the pension fund is going. Um, I mean, it's one of those things that, um, you know, it relates to um, pensions that will be paid out quite significantly potentially in the future, but also some that are more recent. So, um, you know, it is kept under constant review. So we have a valuation each year. We have a full, the triennial valuation is a bigger valuation. is more, you know, more detailed and, and more work goes into that than the annual valuation for the accounts. Um, so, you know, th th there's a lot of control and a lot of um, work goes into making sure that the, the pension fund is valued correctly and and also making sure it's viable. Um, I'm not sure I can really add too much on that, but um, I'm happy to get some more information as a result of the valuation, if that might help the committee. Yes, yes. thank, thank you, Mr. Maddock. That was very clear. Um, I wonder if perhaps um, if we've just had the results of the triennial valuation, uh, whether that might be a suitable item to bring to the committee meeting um, in March, as it's such a key component yeah. of... Um, understanding the assets and liabilities of the council, whether a short item um, in March would be appropriate and would also, I think, be helpful for committee members to understand the process that uh, that goes through to come up with that. Um, Ms. Watts wants to uh, come in. I, I mean, page 103 sets out the key differences, um, Councillor, and the, the biggest changes in terms of changes in financial assumptions. Um, and obviously, you know, we are in the hands of the of the... Um, the actuary uh, in terms of those assumptions, but it, it is set out in some detail on, on that page if it's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Leeming, I believe you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I have a few questions, please. Um, I always think when you look at a full set of accounts like this, um, they should tell a, they, they do tell a story of the year. Um, and this was a pandemic year, and I was wondering if there were any particular things that you would like to point out as being relevant to the pandemic that would explain some of the uh, movements and things. I know you mentioned um, the way people, um, the way the short-term liabilities and assets were affected, the debtors and creditors, but I wondered if there was anything else in there, uh, Mr. Maddock, that you might like to um, explain to us that had, had come from the pandemic. Um, I have another question, um, which is back to page 51, which is the comprehensive income and expenditure statement. Um, the chief executive and the chief operating officer line shows significant variance, but also so does the shared waste and environment line in transformation. And I wondered whether there was any um, sort of overview of, of what those variances had been. And then uh, my final questions are to do with page 79, um, which is uh, investment properties. Um, I think it's, it's a bit of a, um, it's quite a, a complicated note in that there's gains and losses talked about in different places. And in some places, the gains are in brackets, and in some places um, in the text, they're not. And I was just wondering about the second the second table in there, when you're looking at the right-hand column um, on the 31st of March 2021, the £25 um, million pounds that's stated there, is that a gain? Yes, it's a gain. So I was thinking perhaps if losses could be in brackets in that note 12, then that would make that clear to um, a reader, because I think the note above is looking at movements and the second note is a um, balance sheet note. So I don't even know if they're, 
um, in the same... I think if you, if you went in accounting, looking at this, it could be a, a, bit, um, a bit complicated. It, it would just help if we could see whether these were gains or losses. Um, and this is a significant gain. And I guess my last question with that is, does that seem like a reasonable... Does that make sense to you? Do you know what this gain is? Does it, does it have its evidence in reality? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr Maddock? So, um, yeah, I mean, the gain does make sense, given what we've seen locally, and obviously the, the growth that has been seen in, in and around Cambridge. So um, I suspect our investment properties have potentially performed differently than maybe than others in other parts of the country. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised uh, at the gain that we've seen in our investment properties, and we have seen other evidence as well. So, um, I think your yeah, I think your point on the um, the two notes. So I think we perhaps need to look at that and just make sure we've got the go yeah, we, whether we've got the brackets in the right. I think you're right. I think we need to just double check 12A just to make sure we've got um, the brackets in the right place. Uh, what have you. Um, I mean, as regards, was it transformation and uh, shared waste, wasn't it? Um, it's probably better if, if we're providing a response in relation to Chief Executive, maybe it makes sense to provide a more detailed response than those two at, at the same time as we do that. Um, oh, the other one was about the pandemic, wasn't it? That's right. So, um, I think the main areas that we've seen affected by the pandemic are the debtors, creditors, and the pensions liability. Um, I'm not sure there's anything else that was particularly affected significantly by the pandemic. I mean, property values uh, on our council housing did go up, and I'm not sure with that. I don't think that that would necessarily be something that would be obviously affected by the pandemic. Um, and say investment properties went up, and that's I think did bump the trend perhaps a little bit compared to other parts of the country. Um, I'm not sure there's anything else particularly. It's mainly around creditors and debts, I think, and the pensions liability. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Maddock. If you could provide by circulation just uh, an explanation of those variances that have been have been highlighted, that would be that would be very much appreciated. Yeah, okay. uh, are there any further comments from members of the committee? Um, I, I want to ask uh, one sort of perhaps slightly philosophical question. Um, so through, um, you know, through the narrative and then on into the uh, main statements, there are lots, uh, there are many different measures of the council sort of surplus or deficit, depending on which funds you're looking at, what kind of basis, what kind of treatment. Um, how would you advise um, kind of the, perhaps, you know, uh, members of the council more widely? If, if there was a measure to look at, which perhaps encapsulated the financial sustainability of the council, um, which of the various measures on offer do you think, uh, to your mind, captures um, captures that essence of how the council is doing financially? I think I'd probably say the health of our balances, our reserves, and our balances on our housing revenue account and our general fund. So um, those are on the page. Was it, was it 52? So on page 52 in the movement and reserves statement, right at the bottom there, you've got the balances on our general fund, our EMR reserves, our housing revenue account. So... Um, in particular, those are our usable reserves, so they're sort of money we've got available to use either on the revenue um, or capital, if we're talking about capital receipts and capital grants unapplied. So I think that's probably the best sort of measure to look at. Um, the CIES uh, shows us our income and expenditure for the year, but it doesn't really show us the full picture, so I think the, a, better, a better picture is the, the balances that we actually hold at the year end. Thank you. So to, to interpret what you've pointed out there, for instance, on the general fund, um, you know, it, it shows a decrease of, uh, of sort of 
two million out of presumably an initial uh, the initial balance of, of 13. So in effect, we sort of in, in very simple terms sort of used two out of 13 million pounds in reserves over the course of this particular year on the, the general fund. Is that a kind of is that a sort of loose-ish statement that you'd be you'd be comfortable um, councillors making and understanding? Yeah, so the, the line above you'll see for each of the, the relevant reserves what the what the changes actually were. So you can see, yeah, both the general fund and the HRA, we did use a bit of our uh, balance that we held at the start of the year. Um, but overall, you can see that we've still got balances in hand available for use at a later date. Thank you. That, uh, that's very helpful. Any final comments? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Secretary. I'll help myself, Chair. I mean, I do think you need to look at, uh, if you're going to look at the general fund balance, you need to look at the earmark reserves balances as well, uh, which increased by almost 15 million. So, you know, it's very hard just to take one figure from these accounts and say, that tells the story. You kind of need to look at things in the round. Yes, I wonder perhaps, it, it, it's a good point, I wonder perhaps some combination of the general fund and the earmark reserves might be an interesting, I mean, because by earmark, this is, this is money that we have ourselves set aside and could presumably unset aside if we needed to have i understood that correctly that sort of discretionary rather than uh, anything contractual yeah so the, the earmark reserves are things we set aside for specific activities what i would point out and i did forget this point when i was answering councillor leaning's query, uh, query was that um, a significant amount of that does actually relate to covid money that we had in hand so some of that would then automatically get spent in the following year and obviously we can't tell that so um, I think there was an overall increase in our own EMR reserves, but quite a bit of that was, was COVID money to be paid out in 2021-22. I wonder, perhaps reflecting on our, on our conversation, whether there is a place in the narrative for, for some sort of um, you know, reserves that are our own, whether we've earmarked them for some project or not, and whether they're going up or down. Um, might help. I'm thinking, I mean, obviously, we're all happy to look at lots and lots of different numbers and lots of different ways of cutting the same thing. But I'm thinking perhaps of uh, some of our colleagues who, who don't have the joy of this committee on a regular basis and how we might best communicate with them. I'll, I'll leave those thoughts. Um, I'll, leave, I'll leave you perhaps with those thoughts and we can, uh, we can come back to that. And if if uh, Council is interested, on, on page 74 of note 8, we have a bit more of a breakdown of the EMR reserves. So there was a 6.4 million added uh, to reserves in relation to COVID. So sort of just less than half of that increase related to uh, COVID money. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful to highlight as, as we reflect on the, this is a sort of pandemic set of uh, accounts. Um, so I believe we have been asked to uh, note and comment on the report, which we have done so. Uh, thank you, members. Um, the final item uh, is matters of topical interest. Um, are there any matters of topical interest that members wish to raise? Councillor Williams. A couple of things. Uh, first of all, talk it, talk it, talk it. Training, please. Thank you. I feel like this is becoming a, a sort of a, you know, a ritual of my requests. But um, I appreciate there's a lot going on. I've si looked at both that's uh, training that's potential chair happy to do both um, I'm somebody that thinks that you know the more the better on that score um, particularly I know there's going to be well there's been moved to some change around CIPRA haven't they they haven't come in already and and we did have when I first became a councillor and this was for all members uh, CIPRA came in and did a training day for us and it was incredibly useful incredibly good and actually Alex Collier um, arranged for some investment training, didn't he? Mm -hmm. um, which was very, we, it was essentially done in, in a role play and games. It was very, very interactive and very good. I understand while we were in the pandemic, you know, councillors, we couldn't come in and do what we were doing then, but I, I don't see why we couldn't have those sort of training days now. And I'm wondering that's something that could be looked at. So not just for us, but but for the SIP form, it's very good for a county whole, particularly taking into consideration the comments that made earlier by Councillor Leaning about, like, several of us here are, are accountants or work in finance, therefore it's a lot easier for us to pick this up. But that's not true of all members. Um, and our role is to support them and to help them. 
um, particularly on thinking when budgets come up and, and the like, all members have a role to play, not just us. So I think that would be helpful. Um, the other thing, and I appreciate this is just, this is probably actually about genders in, in a whole. If we look at our cover sheet today, um, at, in the top left, we've got address, we've got telephone number, we've got a fax number. I'll be interested to know when the last time we got a fax, but I do know for some reasons we need it. We've got the, email, um, we've got the website, but no email address up there. And I appreciate, when I look right down to the bottom, you can see with Patrick... Off. Oh, there we back. Patrick's name and lights on the bottom, but I'm just wondering if we can have fax in our reports. Maybe it's time to add our email as well. Um, so there was that. Third and final thing, Chair, is that going forward, we know that there's going to be difficulties with, with finance and, and everything in the current financial situation. And that puts more emphasis on our commercial investments and the like, and things like Ermine Street and other, other things that have been bought. One thing that I don't feel we've ever truly found a way to do at this committee is sort of post scrutinise in, investment decisions. We get the accounts, we can see how things are going overall, but I think when we had the first um, financial purchase, post-purchase, it did come to audit. We've never had anything since. And at the time it was expressed, there was we ex assumed that audit at some point would have a view on the investments that have been made. Um, and several you know, multi-million pound investments have been made since. So I'm wondering, Chair, with, with offices um, and portfolio holder, if, if required, we could look at a way of us monitoring the performance of those investments. Um, as, as a council, we are so you know, reliant on that now um, to support much of our income and the current climate. Um, and on those investments and companies, just wondering how often we check um, and alter our offices at company's house. I only say this because I'm aware of former council officers that are still appearing on, on company's house in relation to some of the companies. That may be by arrangement, and that may be that they've agreed to continue that role, for example. Um, but I don't know, so I thought best, best to raise and, and check we have a process for that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I believe, um, Mr. Manning, I might, I might turn to you if I can for the, the toolkit. I believe we have a, a, a very late uh, Christmas present for, uh, yeah, for, for, for Councillor Williams on that, and perhaps you could address the other points as well. Thank you. So um, we're hopefully going to go for the 16th of March as a date to carry out the work on the toolkit. I'm hoping you're available. Why are you shaking your head? You're not available. It's quite difficult. It's, yeah, I mean, you're not available for that day. I'll see what I can do. I will see what I can do. Mm. I mean, we, we obviously want to hold it in person. I, I think it's a bit sort of like a workshop type type thing. And I think... Um, so you got what? Uh, Yeah, so um, if, if councillors could please check their diaries for the, uh, the 16th of uh, March, that's a suggested date for reviewing uh, the SIPFA audit toolkit, um, which, I think we, which I think we decided was the more relevant, perhaps, to the work of the committee than um, some of the other options that we looked at. Um, I, I think so. I think that's certainly the one I think we should concentrate on. Um, it'll be, well, we're, we're intending to do it in the afternoon of the 16th. Um, Hopefully, if, if the members are available, um, I'm not sure how long it'll take, probably a couple of hours, I would guess, but um, that's Thank you. sort of the thinking at the moment. Thank you. Um, Councillor Williams, I'll take away your comments on uh, investments and the kind of the post-scrutiny of investments and whether there's a, a role that this committee can play um, in addressing those. I agree that they're going to be of increased importance. Um, so perhaps, Mr. Maddock, you and I can have a, have a talk about that outside the meeting as to how we how we best put that into place um it, who, who's responsible for updating company's house which was an issue that uh, councillor williams raised in terms of our subsidiaries and uh, and so forth 
So I'm happy to raise that with um, the officers, because obviously the uh, directors of the administration should be updating that, I would have thought. Well, South, sorry, South Council. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do know of uh, one past officer that is potentially still involved, so I don't know whether it's that officer or somebody else that's still listed. But, um, we can certainly check that out. Thank you. That would be, uh, that would be appreciated. Um, are there any other matters of topical interest? Regarding Emin Street, a couple of the non-executive directors have just stepped down because I think it's their six-year period has expired. So whether that's actually been updated to reflect that, um, I'll, I'll inquire. But uh, it's a good point. Thank you, Councillor Sanford. That would be uh, that would be much appreciated. If there is no further uh, business, um, so the date of the next meeting is Thursday, the 23rd of March at 10 a.m., returning to our normal morning slot uh, for that meeting. Um, if there is a need for a, a, a one-item meeting between now and then to sign off on the audit, um, I will circulate details to all members and uh, details will also be published uh, in the uh, usual process on the website and in other communication channels. Um, Thank you very much, everyone. I declare the meeting closed at half past three. Thank you very much for coming.